I know that we've already probably been through two, three days of working and you're stressed out a little bit. Maybe you're going through stuff. I'm so thankful, God, that you made it to the house of God tonight. I know Pastor and Sister Kristen, I know they're in um, Florida General Conference. So I know that they would be um, thankful that you guys are still faithful to the house of God even when they're not here. Amen. What a beautiful presence of the Lord that's in this place. We're going to go ahead and um, I'm going to go ahead and speak here tonight. I don't intend to be very long. I will tell you from the onset. But I do feel that God has given me just a word, just a word for this church. And how you receive it is based on how you're going to receive it. Everyone may receive it different. But tonight before coming, I just praying and I feel God just kind of tug on my heart and say tonight is a night of self-evaluation. Self-evaluation for you. For you. Now other people may have their own opinions of your evaluation of what we're going to talk about tonight. But that doesn't mean that it's always true. It's only going to be between you and God, this evaluation tonight. And we're going to just talk just for a few minutes tonight. Let's go ahead and turn. We're going to have three different passages of Scripture. We're going to turn to John chapter 4, 31 through 34. And we're going to read in the New Living Translation. This is right after Jesus was with the Samaritan woman. This woman that had no hope, this woman that was looking for something. She's been divorced five times, and the woman that, or the man that she was with, she wasn't even married to. She was shunned. And the Bible says in um, John 4, 31, it said, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. And the disciples respond, did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. Now let's turn over to John chapter 6, 30 through 35. We're going to read there. The Bible says in verse 30, it says, "Then, then said therefore unto him, What sign shewest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What doest thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, And giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. We're going to turn to one more scripture. Matthew 5, chapter 6. The Bible says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That word hunger literally can mean to long for or to crave after something. For he that hunger, crave, longeth for me shall never hunger and shall never thirst. Let's go ahead and pray over this uh, night's message Lord, I pray, God, today that you administer in a way that you want to minister. God, I pray, God, today that your perfect will be accomplished. Lord, you know who's in this house. God, you know who needs to hear the word. God, I pray, God, that you would open our ears and our mind, anoint my mouth, God, to speak the word in the way that you want it to come across. Lord, I pray against anything that would get in the way. God, I pray that your perfect will would be accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all may be seated tonight. I want to talk just for a few minutes on just this little thought. What are you hungry for? What are you hungry for? If I were to ask you of a time you were hungry or really craving something, I'm very confident 
We all would have a story to, de- to tell. It's in our very DNA. Food is what gives us the energy that we need to get through our every day. We need the substance of food. That's how we're able to function. But I'm afraid some people here, they need food a little more um, quick than others because what happens is if these certain type of people don't eat in a timely manner, they don't just get hungry, they get hangry. You know what I'm talking about? We probably got some people in here that, you know, I know I have some friends in here if they don't eat, if they don't have food in the sub, their substance or in their belly, they start to get a little hangry. But this, this hunger that we get, it, it's, it's who we are. It's what God, how God made us. And it's almost like that commercial, that snicker commercial where, you know, where that person is not themselves, right, until, they're, until they have a snicker ball and you hear that slogan or that quote, you're not who you are when you're hungry or when, when you haven't eaten. That's pretty much how some people in here, I'm sure, have acted. if they don't have the food in enough time. It's how God made us. For years, popular belief has held that our cravings indicate what is lacking in our diet, that, that our craving our bodies is a way of telling us what we need. While that's not um, entirely false, um, but it doesn't always tell the whole story. Most of us have a food craving. In fact, 97% of women and 68% of men who participated in a study published in the journal Appetite reported experiencing a craving. Cravings are motivated as a motivational state that gives us the urge to seek out and consume a particular food. You know the feeling no matter what you eat, You're not satisfied until you eat that one thing that you're craving. And it's amazing what somebody will do when they're hungry or when they're craving. For example, the love of my life, my wife, there's times that she'll be sitting in the living room and I'll be in the den and I'll just be relaxing. And then out of nowhere, I'll get this little buzz via text message on my phone, and out of nowhere, it doesn't say nothing. All it is is a little emoji of an ice cream cone, right? A little, and I have two options. I can either go in there and I can say, what type of ice cream do you want? Do you want me to go to the store? Or I can wait a few minutes, and guess what will happen again? Another text message will come of another emoji of an ice cream cone, or somebody, I don't know, some crazy thing of somebody wanting ice cream. And she will even, she'll crave it so bad that I'll have to actually get up, put clothes on, go get the key, go in the car, get the keys, go all the way up there, and I'll come back just to satisfy her craving. I'm being a little facetious because I don't mind doing it for her. But cravings, it's amazing what we'll do when there's a craving. Um, mind you, there, there's two options th- that we have or that I had with my wife. I had to either do it for her, right, so she could be satisfied, or I could let that craving continue to fester, and then I would probably be a miserable person, right? <laughs> so just to, just to satisfy her. But it's amazing what people will do. There was a person, and we all know his name. His name is Elvis Presley. It was 1976. He was said that he craved a fool's gold loaf, a sandwich he once had in Colorado Mine Company in Denver. And he said this, he loved the sandwich so much that he got all of his people together, all of his, his people that he was working with, and hopped on a private jet plane and drove, went, flew all the way to Denver, Colorado, just to have this sandwich. We're talking about a craving, what people will do When there's a craving. There was a lady that admitted to eating a half a cake, she confessed to. She said, I should have only had one piece. But she said, I enjoyed the cake so much that I ate the whole cake. And then I baked another one. So when all the people came over, I forced myself to eat one more piece. And then she said, I ended up, you know, barfing over the dinner. But she said it. I, she ended up confessing that craving for cake was so strong that she could not 
leave it alone. Here was another guy who wanted a cheeseburger so much that he told his wife that he was going to go to the gym. He said, I'm going to go to the gym, but instead he went to McDonald's and he began to eat the cheeseburger. But he had to wait for a while because he wanted her to think, him or his wife to think that he was going to be out working, working out. So what he did, he ate the cheeseburger, waited 30 minutes to an hour and hurried up and got home before she knew it and got water and sprayed it all over his shirt and, and his hair to make it, make it seem like he's been sweating at the gym. It's amazing what people will do when they have a craving for something. I recently read that sometimes people gain weight because they misinterpreted hunger cues. For example, sometimes we think we're hungry when we're really thirsty or tired or feeling kind of a feeling we'd rather avoid. See, there are different kinds of hunger. There's a regular, a physical hunger, and then you might call a stomach hunger. But there's also another physical sensation that some call a mouth hunger, which is that feeling when your body is not actually in need of calories, but you want to experience of eating maybe something crunchy or something salty. And is the thing is, if you get that signal misunderstood, what happens is, is you could be craving something like a piece of chocolate. But before you know, you're not able to recognize that craving that you'll go out and get you a three-course meal. And what will happen is, is it can do a damage to your body. You should have just been able to recognize that craving. But you couldn't because you weren't satisfied with that burger. And what happens is, is when you're not satisfied with something, you begin to put stuff in your body and it can eventually cause a weight gain, right? But I, what I feel in the spirit is there's, God is trying to reach out to people right now and is wondering, is, is there anybody in the house of God that is craving for me? Is there anybody in the church here that is wanting me to do something in their life? Because what happens is that inner man is craving, is naturally going to crave for its maker. And what will happen is if we do not recognize that craving, what we do is we end up filling up that craving with things of the world. And we try to satisfy something that was meant to be satisfied by God. And we go through life wondering, God, why can't I make it? Why do I feel down today? God, I, I, I have pleasure. You know, I make tons of money. I do all these things because you're trying to feel a satisfaction that it only can be filled by God. And if you're not able to recognize that, what happens is you're doing more harm than you will ever do good. And I'm here tonight just to give the word tonight and remind the church this evening, just like God has put a hunger and a craving for food and the natural to fill the void in our belly, there is a void in the heart of human man that needs to be filled by God. And if we don't recognize that tonight, what will happen is we'll be on a path of loneliness and hopelessness because we will try to fill a void that only God can feel. And God wants me to tell the church tonight, what are you hungering for in your life? What are you craving for tonight? Is there people in Virginia Beach that still crave for my presence? Is there anybody in this place that still craves for a walk with God, or have they filled their spirit so much with things of this world that they have lost the very appetite for the things of God? You've lost your very appetite from what God wants to do in your life. It's hard to pray anymore because what you're doing is you're feeling that void with things of the world. And before you know it, that disconnection between you and God Come on, we can look all the way around. We can look at people right now. If you've been here long enough and you wonder where people are, 
You say, God, where's that family at? Where's that man at? Somewhere down the line, their appetite was killed because they end up feeling something that God meant to feel in their heart. And they filled it with self and they filled it with flesh. And we don't know where they're at. Come to find out the more that you feel with flesh, it's so much easier to stay away from God. It's so much easier to be disconnected with God when you're trying to feel it with the things of this world. See, God is longing for you tonight. That self-evaluation is only between you and God. Where is your hunger level? What are you hungering for? Are you trying to satisfy something that God wants to satisfy in your spirit with something in this world? And no one can answer that question tonight but you. Like I said earlier, you may have opinions. People may have opinions about your walk with God. But guess what? They don't have the final opinion only between you and God. And let me tell you, you may be on, you may be on cloud night with, line with your relationship with God right now, but this may be your first time coming in, in an apostolic service. Let me tell you, no matter where you are in that scale, God wants a relationship with you. God cares about your life. He doesn't care about your failures and your mistakes. He wants to fill that void in your heart. But you have to will, be willing to have a crave, to have a hunger for him. See, in the natural, there are two hunger killers. There's things, there's two hunger killers in the natural. And the number one killer is sickness. The first thing that keeps you from being hungry is when you're sick. It's kind of hard to want a cheeseburger when you feel like you're going to throw it back up, right? It's kind of gross, but when you're sick, you don't want to hunger. But let me tell you, in the spirit, if you're sinning all the time, you're not going to be feel close to God. You're going to be disconnected from what God wants to do in your life. God hates sin. God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. If you're living a life that is contrary to the word, word and you're trying to find out why I don't have an appetite for the word of God, why I don't have an appetite to want to pray and, and be what God wants me to be, evaluate yourself. Say, God, is there anything in my mind? Is there anything in my heart that would disconnect me from you? God's wanting a relationship with you. Sin will always kill a hunger for anything. That has to do with God. Sin will always dis disconnect you from your relationship with him. Number two, in the natural, just like sickness hinders your meal in the hunger, in the natural, snacking will hinder your, your hunger in the natural. See, when we're filled up on food and and even if it's healthy snacks before a meal, it takes away our hunger so we don't desire to want to eat. Likewise, if we are ever honest with ourselves, there's things that we put before God that fill us up so there's no room for God. And God is wanting to fill us up, but we're too filled up with us. We're too fill up, filled up with what we want to do and our desires and our plans and God saying, hey, is there any room for me? Is there any room in your heart for me? Is there any room for me to have a say in what you do in your life? Or are you just going to fill it up by your desires and what you want to do? See, the more, the, thing, time, the more times that we put our own desires, what happens is, is we will begin and that appetite will begin to fade away. I like the way Pastor said it a few weeks ago. He said, we make God a priority, but guess what? We don't always make him the priority in our life. Come on. We've all been there. We've tried, we try to pray every day, but we don't make the priority. And that's what God is looking in the hour in which we live in. I quote the Psalms 42 verse 1. David says it like this, and he said, The heart pantereth their desires after the water brook. But guess what? So doth my heart 
panteth after God. You know what David's just saying? Guess what? Just like a deer when he's thirsty and he wants to drink from the brook, guess what? My heart is had craving for God. And I wish somebody here tonight would get that same craving in their spirit. Like I said earlier, I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what mistakes you, you've done or, or who have done you wrong. God's saying, I want a relationship with you. And all it takes is a moment of repentance. That's all it takes is a moment of repentance. Looking in the mirror and looking straight ahead and say, I failed and I made a mistake. God, forgive me. God, touch my life. You see, we read in the text that God is the bread of life. Let me tell you tonight, God is everything you need. Come on, you may try different areas. Go try your own way. Guess what? You'll find out the things you put your faith in this world will only let you down. Oh, there may be, there may be pleasure for a season, but guess what? It's only going to let you down. Take the bread of life. Take the bread of life. Take the word of God, the relationship with God, because that's the answer to every problem that you have. And I'm nearly done. In our, in our text we read, John 40, 31, here is in the message, the message version. It says, in the meantime, the disciples pressed him and said, Rabbi, eat. Aren't you going to eat? He told them, I have food to eat. You know nothing about. And the disciples were puzzled. Who could have brought him food? And Jesus said, the food that keeps me going is that I do the will of the one who sent me, finishing the work he started. You see, earlier in that chapter, in verse 4, Jesus randomly says this. He says, I must need go through Samaria. Why would he say that? Why would he say that in Scripture? Well, we'll find out here in a few minutes. Because in verse 6, the Bible says that it's then six hours, it's noon. And the disciples were gone away to the city to buy meat. The, the disciples obviously crossed the path with this Samaritan woman. But all they saw was a woman carrying an empty water pot. They could have probably guessed why she was going to the well in the heat of the day instead of going when all the other women went. Her burden was much heavier than just a large clay of jar. Her life was completely weighed down by sin. And her soul was much emptier than her water pots. She was completely alone. See, we've all heard the story of the Good Samaritan. This lady, this girl, was the bad Samaritan. She was what people would probably walk away from because she's been with multiple men. She was a son, probably from her family, son from people in her village or in her town. She, she passed, get this, she passed 12 professional Christians on the road, and they didn't even give her the time of the day. After all, they were on their way to get Jesus something to eat. She was used to rejection from men, probably anticipated it because of all the relationships she was in. And she shows her bitterness and her deep hurt in her first response to Jesus. Get this. In verse 9, it says, How is this, how is this that thou being a Jew ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. In verse 10, it says, If thou knewest, this is Jesus speaking to the Samaritan, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who is this that saith unto thee, give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. What you have to understand, living water was a significant concept for the Jews. Because the Bible says in Ezekiel 47, 9, it says, And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whatsoever the river shall come, shall live, and there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because the water shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live, whether the river cometh. So where this living of water is, there is life, there is hope. Isaiah 12, 3 says, Therefore with joy shall you draw waters out of the well of salvation. The Jews understood what this living water was all about. That's how Jesus can say in verse 13 and 14, he says, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. 
But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting. What was Jesus talking about here? Well, in John 7, 37 through 39, it says, In the last days, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. For this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This woman asked, how do I get this living water? How do I get it? Verse 23 says, but the hour cometh now when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Women, I know you have needs. I know you have issues. I know that you're coming to feel the waters in the natural but God said, I have to go through Samaria. You know why? There's someone that is hurting. There's someone that has a need. There's someone that I've got to meet their need. And a woman was hungry for something. And Jesus says in verse 26, I that speak unto thee am he. I'm the one that can give you this living water. And before you know it, this woman began to worship God this woman began to understand that this woman, this man, Jesus, can give me hope beyond just the natural water that I'm seeking for. But the problem is disciples arrived back just at the end of this conversation, but they didn't have a clue what was going on. They came back and said, we brought you some food, Lord. And he said, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And the disciples asked each other, what food are you talking about? Did someone come and, and bring you food? And Jesus said, a worship. And I, I saw a woman who began to worship me. And we had a, a, a good moment there. And I seen God begin to touch her life. She, 12 professional Christians went into the city and didn't say a word about Jesus. 12 professional Christians had hung out with Jesus a long time but still didn't bring him the right thing to eat. One Samaritan woman got a little glimpse of Jesus, and her life was forever changed. She, God went through Samaria, and the men went to, to, to get a meat, thinking it was a natural thing that Jesus was looking for. And God said, I went to Samaria not to get the meat that's going to feel the natural, but I came to find a woman that was in need so I can give her, her this living water that I have. And let me tell you tonight, I don't care where you are or what you're going through. The King of kings and the Lord of lords is here to give you that same living water that he gave the, the Samaritan woman. And we as a church, God forbid that we get so caught up in trying to feed the man, the flesh, that we miss out on what God is wanting to do. Because that's exactly what the disciples did. They literally missed out on what God was talking about because they were so focused on the man, feeding the man, buying the meat. And God said, you missed a point. I came through Samaria to reach one person. I don't, I don't know where you are this morning. Brother Eric's about ready to play a song. You can all stand to your feet. But this woman, Samaritan, this Samaritan woman, she had a hunger. Because the Bible says that when she began to worship him, instantly revelation came upon her. And you know what she did? She ran back to her town and said, I met a man that told me everything that I did. And God is trying to tell someone here this morning that if you begin to worship me, I will be able to understand Everything that you've been through, I will understand every failure. I will begin to understand of when people done you wrong. But there has to be some type of hunger. 
there's got to be some type of craving for me. You see, Jesus was on his way to Jairus' house. He was on a schedule. He was on an agenda. But along his path to do what he was supposed to do, I'm supposed to go to Jairus' house to pray for his daughter. There was a woman that had a need. And Jesus, who's focused on his journey, said, wait a minute, someone touched me because virtue left me. I don't care what you're going through. Jesus will stop what he's doing if someone has a need. Amen. Come on, we come in with our schedules and things on Sundays and Wednesdays. But guess what? God said, if someone has a need, I'm willing to wreck that up so I can minister yeah. to someone. This may be your first time here. You may not even understand what this whole Jesus thing is. I'm here to tell you, just come and humble yourself and come hungry and allow God to just minister to you. So right now, I'm going to make that appeal right now to the church. Where's your hunger tonight? Is there a craving for God? Have you lost your hunger tonight? If you can make your way to the front. I want this altar call. I want some, some things to be settled in that self-evaluation in which I talked about earlier. Come on, no one knows but you how hungry you truly are. Where is the craving for God? Because God is wanting to use you. God's wanting to minister to you in a mighty way. Come and give it to God. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray over this congregation here tonight. God, I pray, God, that they would feel the spirit in what I've tried to convey tonight. God, I pray, God, that you would touch the heart of every person that is in this room. God, number one, God, I pray that they would realize how valuable they are to you. God, there's no failure. God, there's no mistakes. God, today they can keep them from you. God, if they open up themselves to you and allow God to feel their spirit in their heart, there's no telling what God can do in their life. Come on. Come on. Press a little bit here. Press a little bit here. Come on, God's wanting to work. Come on. We talked about craving. We talked about hunger. How you'll do whatever you got to do to feel that craving. God's wanting to see that in the spirit a little bit. Come on, if you're not, come on, lift up your hands if you feel comfortable. That's just a sign of surrender to God. God, I surrender myself to you. God, I pray in the name of Jesus. God, I pray, God, that you would touch the hearts and mind of your people tonight. God, I pray, touch your people tonight. God, let them feel the love of God. God, let them feel the peace of God. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, for my sister. God, you know every need. You know every worry, God, today. God, I pray, God, that you administer to her heart. God, minister to her mind. Remind her, God, of how much you love her. God, remind her, oh God, of how much of a plan you have for life, oh God. In the name of Jesus. Come on, where's the hunger? God, I'm hungry for you. God, I'm craving for you, Lord, today. Come on, I, I've lost my appetite a little bit, God. I've come just to come and confess it to you. My appetite has dwindled away because I've allowed myself to get in the way. God, in the name of Jesus.